All right, I'll go into presentation mode. Um, yeah, so yes, thank you, Andrew and Barbara for you know, inviting me to give this presentation of some of the work that I've been helping out with, um, with the community systems working group. Um, this is work that has been continuously evolving for the past year and a half. Uh, I initially pitched this um, back in December, you know, just as I've been sitting in on a lot of the internet of production uh, working group calls and I've have this AI project to centralize infrastructure work that I think could be really interesting to share out. Um, and so just really happy to try to get some eyes, fresh eyes on this work um, and, you know, try to you know, get a understanding of how much this, you know, stuff um, is relevant to, to this community. And at the same time, um, you know, starting that conversation around, um, you know, AI tools and infrastructure tools, I'm sure that um, other other people in the internet or production community are also, you know, working on, um, you know, AI projects or interested in learning more. So I think it's, to me, just a really great opportunity to also collaborate with any other people in the group. Um, and you might notice that I slightly edited this heading. So, um, you know, as we evolved, we kind of branded a new section of this project to as promise grid, which I will um, talk more in detail in a bit. So let me, yeah. So then, as I mentioned, this project is part of the community systems working group. Um, we are a maker collective focused on developing open source infrastructures for organizing and managing community efforts. Um, we are led by uh, Steve Trugo. Um, he is the founder of uh, infrastructures.org um, and was previously a VP of engineering at Chase and so has worked many years in kind of building out you know, large scale distributed infrastructures. And this group was formed um, back in after the Nation of Makers 2022 virtual conference. Uh, so Andrew Lamb actually gave a presentation at that event, and that's how we were initially introduced to IOP. Um, Steve played, you know, a, a role, a big role in volunteering um, for the organization of the event. And while it was, while it ran successfully, it took a massive amount of of both infrastructural effort and also human effort. Um, so the initial goal was to figure out how we can organize and execute these types of uh, projects better. So our mission is to eliminate as much of the administrative tasks um, that come with organizing uh, communities. So we see um, some three main problems. So a reliance on you know, ineffective third third party tools, um, you know, with low budget, uh, you know, kind of, it, it kind of tends to be we use, you know, Google Forms and Google Docs and, you know, a free Zoom account. And so things get spread out across a whole bunch of third party tools that don't tend to talk with each other. And then also just the way that, uh, computers interact with each other in the current day um, causes some silos of information due to just the limitations of, um, you know, distributed networks, networking. And a huge problem is also what this leads to is then, you know, dependency on, a, on, a, on one leader in the organization or a few leads, you know, managing a lot of the um, coordination, and then that leads to, you know, burnout, and then that, you know, then the organization tends to start to decay. And so 
we're interested in you know uplifting decentralized and distributed communities so you know, open source projects the maker community at large so manufacturing networks and other nonprofit and social um, impact initiatives and so i use the phrases decentralized and distributed and i might you know kind of interchange them um, a few times but just to give some context so a distributed network um, you can think of you know it's kind of takes the idea of a centralized server and kind of expands it out so that you have these um, sub nodes that then can distribute some of the workload, but at the end of the day distributed networks still rely on you know centralized servers to kind of carry out a bulk of the effort and still kind of depend on those. Um, central servers in a decentralized network each node um, can carry out um, and execute functionality. Um, in you know without a hierarchy and so then these are more self organized um, you know systems. And so then that introduces the larger project that um, the community systems working group is working on um, that we're um, branding as promise grid um, so it is a decentralized hosting network. And so it is a web based um, infrastructure that offers P 2 P network um, communication and real time collaboration, and we are building this um, using um, WASM technology so web, um, web assembly. So you can see here, you know, Grokker um, is an AI tool, but you know, that is one of many, you know, community toolings that we hope to develop over time. So, you know, tools for documentation and scheduling and messaging and, you know, try to build up on this decentralized um, network. And the concept of promise grid is also um, kind of inspired by the promise theory by Mark Burgess um, and the concept of, uh, you know, coordinating self-organized groups and his kind of research in that field. And so today I'm I'll be discussing Grokker, which is utilizes large language models, and we are interested particularly in large language models as a tool for coordinating um, systems. So we find that in the maker community, um, you know, people come from a wide variety of backgrounds and experiences. Um, and are you know often really eager to work with each other, but there tends to be you know different you know skill sets and you know terminologies, and so um, with large language models, um, we find that it we can bridge the gaps between technical and non technical teams, and have people work more effectively with each other. Another interesting point um, that we've and have been exploring is the concept of uh, lang language based consensus um, versus uh, price based consensus. Um, so uh, an AI tool uh, for reaching agreement through qualitative consensus versus, um, you know, the more traditional decentralized or a, a form of consensus making like in blockchain, um, which you know, kind of follows a paradigm that is kind of traditional global financial systems of boiling everything down to a price and then, you know, kind of creating that virtual market um, to try to create decisions. Um, we think that LLMs can provide us a way to kind of sidestep that need to kind of price out um, decisions and kind of form um, consensus in that way. And so what is Grokker? So Grokker is a, a tool for interacting with your local files and, um, you know, such as documents and code. So this is currently in its current state, a local um, tool that, that you would download into your uh, machine. Um, and 
uses OpenAI's API of GPT-4 to query and uh, generate documents and code. Uh, so some of the features are that you can um, feed it multiple, multiple different files and then interact with those files and get contacts across um, the, that file directory. Um, it has a local vector database and a, we also can structure the outputs using regex. And so then to give some more context on um, that feature, um, so regular expression or regex is a pattern that describes a set of strings. So you can basically think of it as a uh, pattern that can filter out and kind of structure the output that you want. And so OpenAI's GPT-4 um, reads and writes regex extremely well. We think it's because, you know, it's been trained on, you know, libraries and regex. And thus we can use regex for uh, generating formatted outputs and um, very consistently. So here's, a, you know, just a simple example. So, you know, what is the color of the sky? Your output must match this regex. Um, and then you, you can see this kind of pattern and then the output, you know, would be, you know, color equals blue. And so then now I'll share some three different example use cases that are exploring uh, Grokker's capabilities. So one is querying doc documentation, um, two, generating um, you know, structured outputs and kind of what that means. And then finally, uh, an experimental feature that we've been exploring, which is uh, multi-agent creation. So Grokker can query information from a lot of different text-based documents. In this case, um, I had pulled uh, a syringe pump um, project from the open know-hows um, search directory and um, you know pulled in from, from the GitHub repo kind of the documentation. Um, you know, that included, you know, the assembly instructions, troubleshooting, calibration, and, you know, the readme. And so I will attempt to do a quick demo of, you know, this. So here, you know, is the GitHub. Um, I've already kind of added those files into my directory. And so I, you know, moved, went into my command line and I'm currently in this folder. So then doing, you know, grok, you know, q. Well, first I can say grok, um, you know, help, or grok h. You know, this gives you the list of all the commands that are available to you. Um, so then q, um, you know, ask uh, the knowledge basic question. So I do grok. Q and I say, um, in this example, you know, I've assembled the the syringe pump. So then, you know, why isn't my screen um, working? And so then, as I as I submit that question, it gets fed into um, OpenAI server and connects you with you know this database, and then says. You know, here you get the answer. The issue could be related to the connectors of the screen cable. Customers have reported this problem. You know, try cutting off the plastic key and you know rotating the the connector in the socket. Um, so then, this is just you know a simple example of how you could uh, query um, using Grokker. Do a query in, in text space files. Um, and so then a second uh, demo is uh, generating and editing structured outputs. And before I go into that demo, um, you know, I'll kind of give 
the the input looks a little bit more um, complicated. So, you know, now we are using the grok chat function. So then the chat function allows you to have a conversation with the AI that's multi-step. So it remembers the conversation. So the, the question that you gave it, you know, in in previously, and it'll it can kind of follow along with the chat in similar ways to how you know OpenAI's uh, ChatGPT would work. So in this case, we are creating a CAD model using OpenSCAD. So we're using Chat uh, Grokker to actually create code. Um, so we say write an OpenSCAD file that contains a blue sphere that is one mil millimeter in diameter on top of a cube, two millimeters on each side. And so Grokker will generate um, this system message that it'll send to OpenAI that could then tell it that what you want, what you want to do is create, you know, an open SCAD file. And then here I've highlighted, you know, this is what, you know, is really great about regex and kind of showcases the example of what the regex would look like for this case. So it says, you know, your response must include the following file and must match this regular expression. And so then I will do this as a video. So then, as you can see here, um, you know, this is code um, at the bottom that was generated through that prompt. And so then when you open um, OpenSCAD, you can see that it created um, this initial file, which what you notice is that the blue sphere doesn't look very much like a sphere. So then the great thing about Grok Chat is then you can make um, edits to that code. Um, so then you can call Grokker again. And so then here we would say Grok Chat bar dot chat. Um, and then the dash O is, you know, creating specific for creating code. And so then we say make the sphere have uh, 40 facets. And then you know, we enter that in. It creates the a system message again. And then now um, in that same file that the code initially generated, now it made it, it made an update um, to the sphere's code and shows that. The facet, the sphere is now specified as having um, 40 facets, so highlighted there. And then when you go back and open that file, now you have a sphere that looks much more like, um, you know, the intention. Uh, and so finally, um, the we are exploring multi-agent production. And so to get, give you know just what that is, so we can create LLM agents and give them a specialized role, and then have them work together to accomplish to accomplish a more complex task. So like designing a website or creating you know a video game. Um, so then here. You know, it, it, it is very much like role playing um, with the AI tools and kind of creating these virtual organizations. And so you can tackle more complex tasks, um, do many, many to many coordination and, and also benefit from an increased context window because each um, LLM agent will have, you know, its own memory and then be able to kind of um, work off of each other's kind of shared skill sets. And so for a simple example, we, um, you know, told the AI agents to develop a Pong game. Um, and so then we were able to successfully have them develop and design um, this functional Pong game. So we see, you know, a paddle on each side, a ball that moves, you know, back and forth and they're controlled by um, arrow keys, and there is, you know, a scoring mechanism at the top. 
And so how we were able to accomplish this um, is that each agent is working, was given their own Git branch. And so then a human agent um, begins with, you know, a requirements.md file. So we say, I would like a Pong game um, that is written in Python. And then you would submit that uh, change to the repo. And then the AI agents would detect that change and create updates to their uh, respective output file. So from the requirements.md of, you know, I would like a Pong game, we have a facilitator um, AI agent that creates the tasks. So it says, you know, a Pong game has paddles and a scoring mechanism and a ball that moves back and forth. Um, so it creates all those tasks and nece necessary aspects for the game and then pushes that back into the repo. And then the uh, Pi game developer AI agent then generates um, Python code in pong.py. Um, so it makes its attempt to tackle all of those tasks, pushes those um, tasks, uh, those that code, and then the tester agent, um, you know, verifies whether that code uh, makes sense. So um, kind of giving a second uh, look at code, um, using AI to give a second look to AI generated code often can lead to fixing some, you know, common errors. Um, so the tester agent can see the pong.py game and the task.md and the requirements and say, hey, does this code um, fulfill those requirements? And so then creates a test results um, markdown file that says, yes, you know, this has a paddle and a ball and a scoring mechanism. And so it successfully passes and then it um, sends that off to the repo. And then a human agent can look at the code and kind of then edit any one of these files um, to make corrections or make adjustments and start the iterative process um, all over again. And so in our simple example, each agent was only writing to one respective file. So the developer could only write, or we specified that the developer would only write to pong.py. But in the case that two agents are editing, you know, multiple files or or the same file, then merge conflicts may occur. Uh, surprisingly, um, these AI agents um, are very good at resolving their own conflicts, and the agents can gracefully resolve the results because they can see, you know, all the files. And so if you define, you know, the requirements.md file and the intents, the intent of the project, then the AI agent can make, you know, decisions to, you know, choose which, um, you know, merge um, changes to accept. And so uh, some potential use cases that we see for um, natural language processing and LLMs within Internet of Production, um, we see it, it, it's an incredibly flexible tool and, you know, just throwing some ideas out there uh, that we're curious about exploring. So reading and generating um, files from the open know-how, um, you know, search, um, directory and maybe editing you know manifest files or generating manifests um, using uh, AI and natu natural language processors to be matching agents for the you know open know-how project so connecting um, makers and maker spaces you know with you know contracts for what to make and being able to coordinate those decisions. And then also, um, you know, generate helping um, makers generate, you know, business models, um, you know, through the open uh, business model catalog. And so some work in progress, um, we're migrating uh, the Grokker tool from a local um, CLI uh, control line interface to a to promise grid. And so then creating that 
um, web-based UI, um, exploring the multi-agent uh, modes of production, and then other uh, community tooling, such as event hosting and collaborative um, editors. And so, you know, we're really interested in, you know, collaborators or contributors or, you know, just anybody who's interested in um, learning more. And so I created this uh, feedback form. Um, you can also reach out to me on the Internet of Production forum. Um, I'll also send my uh, LinkedIn and, and I'll send my email as well. Um, and you can also sign up for our Google group um, to kind of get in involved on you know, the, the conversation around um, the work at Community Systems Working Group. And here are also the um, GitHub links for both Grokker and Promise Grid. Um, and then you can also reach out to Steve through uh, GitHub and also um, Twitter. So both both his handles are Steve uh, GT. And so then, uh, yeah, thank you so much. And I can open it up for questions. And Steve will absolutely be here for you know answering some some of those technical details that people might have questions about. Thank you. Very, very much, uh, Donaldo. Uh, before I open up, I am in no doubt that there will be questions. So, like, I'm not at all nervous about the Q and A part. Um, but I just want to uh, congratulate you uh, in the spirit of uh, that first requirement around uh, Rocker and and Promise, which was getting technical and non-technical people to collaborate together. I, I want to. Congratulate you on how pedagogical this presentation was. It's spot on. Like for someone who's not technical and someone who's technical, I'm pretty sure it answers those two. Um, I actually have a question that I prefer prepared. Uh, so please, everyone, start raising your hands, and we'll try to politely hand um, hand over who speaks when. I saw your question, Antonio, and I see you, Andrew. Um, my question is around a use case that's mentioned, I think, in that last slide, potentially. Um, yesterday, we had the launch of the open source hardware directory, which is the IOP Open Know How Initiative, people and other groups from Gosh and Oshawa that are looking at that. They are very much not intending on creating any new designs and documentations or repositories, et cetera. Like, core of what they want to be we want to be working on is like being able to connect with what's out there already in terms of design and documentation. Um, and so from my understanding uh, from reading like, documentation on, on GitHub, um, they Grokker right now like prefers to go through like local files, but is also linked to uh, the global documentation on OpenAI. Um, can you speak Quickly to how you think Rocker would enable us to apply custom assets, to like filter relevancy of search results, so that, for example, you can look for an open source hardware project that that has like the design files or that comes just from Apropedia or like how we could, yeah, how we could do the queries to take into account this filtering questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, um, so the first step in kind of querying, um, you know, files uh, starts with sending the, the file to, you know, some tool, in this case, we use OpenAI's, um, another AI API function that OpenAI has to, as a vectorize the file, so um yeah that it, it was an it was an interesting case that we were exploring with um the the gosh directory because i initially kind of tried to get one of the yaml files but then realized it was it was a link to from a website and so then tried to so then in in the current state you would then kind of have to save that file um as Steve can talk about as how we would as try to 
get files from the internet without necessarily having somebody you know download them first in order to I guess, vectorize it. That makes sense. Steve, want me to dive in? So, so uh, one thing that, in the interest of time and simplicity, what Donaldo didn't show in his live demo that he did there where he was querying the syringe pump project markdown files was there is a step before you start talking to the files is you, there's a there's a grok add sub command. So if you can get the files on your local disk, then you say grok add. It's very similar to a git add if 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 you've used git. So or uh, so you say grok add and um, another thing that Donaldo, Donaldo, you didn't have, I was typing while you were talking, uh, making notes here. Uh, you didn't have the vector database slide in the presentation anymore, right? Do you still have that in your pool? Oh, and you're muted. Yeah, I think it, it was in the kind of side. Oh, I must have been, I must have been oh, no. must have been looking, looking at my other laptop when you had that slide up. So anyway. Um, Essentially, that grok add command uh, does the thing that Donaldo was talking about, about all the, the deep dark voodoo about adding adding data to the vector database so that it's searchable by the AI. Um, so you say grok add, and after that, you can have a conversation with the one or more files that you've done the add on. So that's pretty straightforward. But of course, first, you'd have to have those files on local disk. So I think that's where Donaldo was getting at. Uh, about if the if the file is currently somewhere else on another machine, there would have to be some sort of a fetch that would have to take place there first. Um, right now, I don't have that the the more complex logic that would want to be in Grokker where it would be able to do those fetches by giving it a URL instead of a local file name, for instance. Um, another thing that I don't have in there yet is, for instance, being able to translate a PDF into text so that it can be indexed. That's something that both of those use cases, remote fetches or PDFs are things that I just do manually still. Just use curl or my browser to download the file. And then if it's a PDF, I, I run it through a converter to text. Does that answer the question that you were asking, Barbara? In a way, uh, the idea down the line would be, can, can the search for the relevant files enable before needing to to fetch, identifying what to fetch. So the real problem there, just paraphrasing, you're saying is that is that um, first the user would have to know where the files are. In other words, there there's an index that would be helpful there, right? There is. Um, that's the that's basically what they're gonna be looking at is how can we find what we don't know. Right. Exactly there, so this is. The, there's a whole nother presentation that, yeah. that we have to do in order to be able to, to to describe our own answer to that question. And it has to do with that promise grid thing. And and the, the, the one sentence answer is, if you're hosting all of your stuff, websites, applications, and otherwise on one decentralized machine, everything's there, regardless of what node on the internet it's actually physically residing on. It's abstracted into one giant virtual machine. There's my one sentence answer, but that would be a whole nother presentation. So. Can tell. Um, Antonio, Andrew, uh, and then we've got Ibuka in the chat. In that order? I think, Antonio, I don't think we can hear your mic. Sorry, sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Uh, thank you, Donaldo, Steve, Barbara. Um, so I have a few comments on, on Grokker. The first is uh, critical in the use of OpenAI. It's all, all like, and I see there is a question there in the chat, like how is this different from using ChatGPT? And so I, I see Grokker as an orchestrator and a common by, baseline uh, um, interface for the API, but so the main pro problem with using OpenAI uh, API is like the obscurity of, of of the entire process, and so I I will like 
like um instead of looking on using on continuing using open ai i, I will i won't think it's too crazy to train a, your own model like uh there is a vast resource of uh, information like uh fab academy is a, is a if, if you know fab academy it's a huge source of information on how people things and or and uh, organizes information around projects and um so i'm saying this because um I'm very hesitant on, on using OpenAI, which is not very open, as the name states. And uh, and uh, it, nowadays, it is not that crazy to train uh, your own models. Um, so have you considered uh, looking into this direction? And the other uh, question will be that uh, I see in, with Grokker, you are going through different um, scenarios and and functionalities that are far away from one to to the other like you have the functionality to talk to files and output files and uh and also you have the other one that is like to orchestrate the uh, groups of work like and you have defin defined like um roles in an organization you have can have like a maker ritual organization but so these two are, are far away. So have you um, considered like what is going to be your focus for the future developments of, of, of Grokker? Those are the two questions. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I can um, take on the yeah first question. So yeah, that that is something that we are absolutely focused on when migrating um, Grokker to, you know, kind of its new phase, which is kind of becoming um, AI LLM agnostic and being able to plug in your own um, LLM. Um, so then that, you know, that around kind of creating an AI gateway so that then you can have either, you know, a Llama or OpenAI or, you know, even your own kind of, you know, a trained model and point it to in that way. Um, and I forget. And so then. Diverse functionality was the second question. I see, yeah. I guess there, there is this larger, um, I can kind of share my screen. It might be a very confusing kind of diagram to showcase, um, but. <laughs> You know, you can bear with me. And this kind of goes, I think, to uh, somebody else's question of, you know, what's the difference between Grokker and ChatGPT? Um, but so this is the current state of, you know, Grokker. It's a CLI tool um, that's built in Go. Um, so it does kind of the context chunking and embedding um, and kind of has a vector database and key value uh, store and uses OpenAI. Um, so then moving on to the larger kind of WASM built, and as we were initially calling it WASM grid, but now it's promise grid, um, we would kind of, yeah, create, you know, this version control system management um, kind of microservice and a container management microservice that is separate from, you know, this, you know, context chunking and embedding and cosine similarity search. Um, and then here, you know, with the promise grid, as as you know, I mentioned the AI the AI gateway, so that you can, you know, in the future have a decentralized AI or you know an open source um, language model, and kind of the vector database then lives on a web, um, you know, host. So hopefully that answers I guess, that question. I think it will require a few more conversations, but yeah, uh, congratulations on on the on the vision. Um, I mean, I I don't really like the open AI at yeah. all. Like, mm -hmm. but I see the vision after that, and I I think there's a lot of applications for um one like. 
the challenge here for the engineers and the makers is like, how do you help them to write documentation and, and, and the manifest in an easier way? So if you have gone with something to help them, that is going to help solve a lot of, of uh, pain in, in the maker community. So that, I think that's a, the nice um, vision for that. So thank you for, for your work. All right. Thank you. So I can, I can add a little bit there, Antonio, I, share the same concerns. Um, and the way I see it is it's a bootstrapping step. Um, uh, at, so, at one point, I think we had some language in one of the slides that that Donaldo had where we actually used that term bootstrapping. It's it's this weird thing where we, we kind of have to use the tools that are there, including OpenAI, in order to bootstrap us into the situation where we don't need OpenAI. Does that make sense? So that's 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 the way I see it anyway. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, but there are other tools out there, so maybe try yeah. to look at. Well, I actually, there. Antonio, I'd like to talk to you more about uh, those because mostly I've been looking at the stuff on Hugging Face. Um, Donaldo, you want to throw the uh, sign up slide back up again, and um, I've also put the Google Form link in the uh, Etherpad. Uh, if you want to put your contact information in there, Antonio, I'd like to continue this conversation with you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. I'll jump in here to mention that uh, these calls often run over time, but <laughs> there's five minutes left, and I will make sure uh, the last there are two questions. Andrew has one, and then there is how is how is this different from ChatGPT or other AI tools? And if we can address those two questions briefly, and if Steve and Donaldo are available to stay longer, which they might not be, then we can also continue the conversation once that's wrapped up. Uh, Andrew, microphone to you. Thanks, and thank you for a great presentation. It's a strange thing to have to do on Zoom because there are moments where it's like, yes, congratulations, that's that's fantastic. And um, I have three non-technical questions and they can be quite quick. <laughs> what does Grokka mean? Why did you choose that name? Uh, how are you funded? And um, if you can paint very quickly, given the time available, what does the future look like for communities when this thing is at scale? Do you want me to take the Grokker one, Donaldo? Uh, yeah. Uh, Andrew, um, Elon Musk stole my thunder. Um, by launching Grok in November, mm -hmm. after I've not been using the name since March of 2023. If you've ever read Heinlein, uh, specifically Stranger in a Strange Land, to Grok, something is to understand it so deeply that you become one with it. Thank you. That's a great answer. <laughs> That's where the name came from. Um, but this is uh, a tool we're... to help you to understand Grokka. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's see. Funding. Actually, I should take the second one too. Funding. Andrew, um, in real life, my wife and I run a family manufacturing business, supplying things to the U.S. national labs and pretty much every aerospace company on the planet. Um, and so we're doing okay with that, such that I have the time to work on this project. And also, um, we have a need for this project because as an old infrastructure guy myself, I am sick yeah. and tired of managing individual machines and containers and mm -hmm. Kubernetes and all that kind of stuff. So I want that grid as the infrastructure for my own shop. Yeah. So there's some very strong self-interest there in terms of financial support so far. Thank you. And then what's the future look like when this is at scale? Uh, I'm going to let you tackle that yeah. one, Donaldo, because if I try to, it's going to go on for too long. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I think that it's a it's a big question, but I feel like with the, U, the web UI, we want it to be a simple process. So going back to, you know, the maker community is made up of a whole bunch of people from different technical backgrounds. We don't want, you know, the barrier of entry to be you have to download and install you know this program and you have to sure. kind of kind of do all this all these installations um so you know at scale you know we want it to be kind of 
you know, living on a on a website so that you know you just share this URL, you can kind of generate your own kind of you know uh, working group where you share share this URL with the teams and then you have that kind of open collaboration that you know is very easeful and you know simple. Uh, thank you. I'm going to share the, this recording with a friend of mine who um, his name's Kuldeep. He's a part of the alliance as well, and he manages lots of projects uh, in an innovation lab. And he was talking to me the other day about what I need is an AI that can answer questions and people can just talk to to get people to understand the design, but also they can design the implementation together. So uh, what you, you guys are doing hardware, but let's do the same thing for uh, for projects as well at some point. So thanks, thanks for these questions, and uh, absolutely, let's see if there's ways that we can um, integrate the Internet of Productions work um, further with what you're doing. Very much. I'm going to stop the recording now. Uh, if I find out where that button is. Um, and then I'm, uh, wait, actually, before I do that, there was a last question, which was, um, so can you tell us a bit about how this relates or is different from or adds on other AI tooling out there like chat GPT? Like, is it the command line? Um, yeah. is it the link to open AI? Yeah, I... So yeah, the the experience or like the yeah the difference I think that I want to highlight, um, you know, between Grokker and Chat GPT. So you are having this conversation and you can ask it. You know, you go on on the URL and you say, "Hey, I'd like code," and it kind of often kind of gives you this like summary of what it's doing and then gives you this code snippet. And so then the process from there would be then you copy and paste that to a local file. You go from your Chrome or web web browser to you know your file, and then you kind of execute it, and you try to see what what it does, and then you can kind of like say, oh, I I need a modification or I need an edit. So then let me go back to the web interface with ChatGPT and kind of give it some fixes or have a conversation with it. It'll try to you know create you know those edits. Then you have to copy and copy in that snippet and go back to that file and make that edit yourself. I think what's really cool about Grokker is that it's all integrated and kind of unified with with kind of your um, local, you know, with it with the structured outputs. It creates that file for you already in your system, so then you can open it, run it, and see if you need any modifications, and then just send it any modifications you need, and then it'll work work within that same file that you are also using. And so it can be a more collaborative experience. Um, so that's that's one. It's, I have follow-up questions, but I was wondering if anyone else. Oh, Steve, you're, you want that? Well, I was just, just going to add, I'll try to keep yeah, it to right. one sentence. But when I originally wrote the tool back in early 2023, it was simply so that I could have a conversation with a friend's research paper. Uh, that friend happens to be Mark Burgess. He's the same guy that was mentioned in the presentation about the promise theory stuff. And Mark tends to make up his own terminology as he goes, um, but he's very, very smart and very insightful. And I really enjoy talking to him. And the thing about the large language models is they're very, very good at understanding language and terminology and quickly understanding made up terminology that's in someone's research paper. The first thing I wrote the thing, the first reason I wrote the thing was, so, was for that purpose, to be able to absorb a local document and be able to have a conversation with it. Now, since then, and this is to Antonio's point, since then, um, OpenAI has added the ability for you, for you to upload your own documents, but that gives you even more lock-in to OpenAI. And so as long as you're able to keep your own documents in your own vector database on your own hard disk, it helps you avoid that eventual lock-in where we have yet another centralized service that we're dependent on without the flexibility of going somewhere else. Right. That was more than a sentence, but yeah. I, does that answer your question better? It does, actually. Um, 
Uh, I would like to say a big thank you to everyone who shows, showed up for the call and uh, contributed to the conversation. Uh, thank you. I'm aware a lot of people need to drop off now. I will keep the call open because I can sense that Donato and Steve seem to be willing to continue answering questions. Um, I actually have one more, but uh, Rebecca, uh, Ziadi, Joseph, Richard, do you have any questions? Nope, happy to listen. Cool. Then my question follows up on the one, on, on like the discussion we were just having, which is then, uh, I'll admit this is a question from Sarah, so I'm reading my notes to make sure that I understand the question. Uh, and basically it's a data privacy question. Um, Cause from what I understand and from what she understands, um, we're having a chat conversation with the AI, right? And it is capturing therefore the questions to do this iterative loop if I'm using the right vocabulary. But then again, Grokker is cool with people using their own vocabulary and explaining it back. So um, how, yeah, what is the data privacy question around the chat conversation because I wasn't sure if it was or wasn't saved from the presentation. It seems like it's saved from what we had understood at the Git repository, it wasn't. So for all the data privacy purists out there, can you tell us more about privacy issues? So I do have a disclaimer at the bottom of the readme for Grokker that addresses that and what yeah, it says. Yeah, I saw it. Thing. Yeah, you did see that, yeah. So, so as long as we're using OpenAI as the backend servers, Yes, everything that you um, enter and everything that you add to your local vector database does need to be sent to OpenAI servers for generating the embedding vectors as well as uh, later context when you're actually providing a prompt and getting an answer back. And so that's another reason why a why Antonio's questions were extremely valid is that we want to get to the point where no we're not dependent on that third party service and this th this is the strange thing is that it, it, it this is not the first time in computer science of course where we've had to use the thing we don't want to use in order to get to the point where we want to be right that's what I mean by that bootstrapping process you've gotta you've got to somehow start somewhere and then break out of that loop. That was all for my questions. So I think I can close the recording now. Um, if I, there it is. Goodbye, everyone on the internet. <laughs>